All right, Greenwich High School, uh, we are ready to rock and roll for our um, senior parent presentation. Uh, we know that there are going to be um, some seniors joining us and some and parents joining us. This is primarily for parents because the school counselors had a um, short Google Meet uh, during flex time uh, yesterday uh, for the seniors specifically, and they each had approximately 50% of their seniors be able to attend, so we're very glad about that. Um, however, um, you know, we will be sharing generic information that will uh, help in, uh, both seniors and their parents um, be well informed about this uh, senior application process. So, uh, first of all, uh, you know, I'm Judy Nidell, I'm the coordinator of, of guidance, and I'm here with Allison Lockridge, our college and career counselor. Um, Greenwich High School has always had a college and career counselor. Um, this is my 22nd year in the district, um, so definitely before my time. I was actually hired as a halftime college and career counselor um, 22 years ago, um, and that uh, that. Uh, role in Greenwich High School allows all of us to be centered around um, the college process and the college application process. Uh, whether you are a family going through the college application for the first time or the fifth time, uh, it will definitely be stressful. Um, seniors have a full uh, list of courses that they have to worry about, you know, keeping their grades up. And then they're basically, you know, having a whole nother job in, um, you know, completing applications, making sure their essay is done, requesting letters, et cetera. Um, so please understand that we respect the fact that it is a stressful time for seniors and for their families. Um, but as a school counseling department, we meet weekly um, and we make sure that everyone is on the same page and that everyone's cooperating all together to um, serve all of our seniors. Um, and the very important people in the houses that um, play a huge role this year, even if you have not necessarily worked with them before, are our guidance assistants. So every house has a guidance assistant. They um, assist the three school counselors in the house, and they are the primary person that facilitates the um, sending of letters of recommendation and transcripts to colleges. Um, so I, you know, obviously, you know, the school counselors are busy. Allison Lockridge is busy. You will need to make appointments with the counselors in order to um, have some of their time for the bigger picture stuff. Um, but if it's anything, excuse me, <coughs> I think I should get a drink of water. <clears throat> anything that um, is uh, related to the actual application and getting documents out, your guidance assistant is, your, is a great first line of defense. And I would like you to please contact them if you need anything. <clears throat> One of the things that the counselors um, talk to about their um, to their seniors on Friday is to make sure that they make appointments with them. So now that we are done with the first cycle of the school year, the counselors are now shifting their attention to the seniors, meeting with them, make sure they are all set to go with their applications. And um, you know, also Ms. Lockridge has some time for uh, students to make appointments with her as well. Um, parents, uh, your role is vitally important in this process. Um, you know, uh, seniors, despite how well organized they might be and how on top of things, will definitely need your support with organization and structure, especially maybe some time structure. Uh, one of the things that Allison will focus on and in the um, document that we already shared with you about score and timeline and dates and everything, um, we, we need to have our seniors uh, request their transcripts and score by October 1st for all those early application deadlines. And that is because when the seniors go in and move their um, uh, college to the applying column, that alerts both the counselor, the guidance assistant, and teachers of your first deadline. Um, so we realize again that it is early. Um, however, you know, we've been doing this for many, many years, and we know this is a successful process to make sure that everything is done um, by the uh, application deadline. Um, so that's all I have. And now uh, we have uh, Allison Lockridge to share the bulk of our information this evening. We will be able to take your questions um, through the little Q&A feature in Zoom. Um, and we will, I'll keep reading them while Allison is presenting. If we can answer questions while she's speaking, we will try and do that, but otherwise we'll answer them at the end. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Judy. Uh, you go get yourself a glass of water. Um, 
So as Judy mentioned, uh, deadlines are coming up pretty quickly and it can be challenging at this time of year for, for everybody involved, seniors, parents, um, counselors, teachers, because it's a, it's a tight kind of timeline. I mean, really in the next month, many seniors are going to be submitting applications. Um, so early action and early decision deadlines range from October 15th through November 15th. Um, early decision is binding so that um, students applying early decision would only be applying to one school early decision. And early action is, is not binding. And um, the benefit is you can find out your notification you know, sooner than if you apply regular decision. So the majority of our students do apply early action and or early decision. Um, but it's also not for everybody. So if somebody is not you know, ready to get their application out in that time frame, then they should talk to their counselor. Um, but like I said, the majority of students are submitting applications sometime in the next month or two. And then regular decision deadlines um, come up a little bit later in January. So usually your first round of applications get submitted by November and then second round of applications um, uh, around the holidays. And there's also an early decision two deadline right around January one um, for some schools. So some schools have, um, so two different versions, early decision one and early decision two. So let's say a student might not be ready to uh, make a decision to apply ED one, but they may be ready a little bit later in January. And so early decision two could be a good option for some students. Um, not all colleges have early decision too, but you should be aware that that some do. But again, this is this is binding. So if, if a student's accepted early decision, they're making the decision to to go to attend. Um, and then I did want to also point out that some schools have rolling decision. And what that means is um, admissions counselors are reviewing applications as they come in. So the longer you wait to submit an application for rolling decision, um, if a school has rolling decision, the harder it is to get in because they're filling the class as they read applications. So generally, and there's not a lot of schools that don't have rolling decision, um, but generally if a school does, the, um, you know, it's best practice to try to submit your application um, sooner than later once, once you're ready. So seniors are very busy working on their common application. Um, some students got a jump start over the summer and maybe finalizing it. Other students may be starting it. So we recognize that, you know, students are at different places at this point. Um, but uh, bottom line is if, if seniors are applying early, they should be very busy working on their essays and just the overall common application itself. Um, I did just want to point out a few pieces of the common application and the common application for those of you that may not be familiar with it is just a one application that over 500 schools um, use so most of our students are using the common application for majority of their schools. Um, so obviously you have the main essay and then many colleges have supplemental essays and that's what I've been having a, a lot of meetings with seniors in the past. Um, a uh, week and a half or so um, talking through some of these supplemental essays. So it's important to, um, to make sure that you're aware that some schools do have these extra essays, which some seniors don't realize. So the best way to find out is by adding the colleges to the common application if, if a senior hasn't done it yet, and then answering the college specific questions. And that's where you'll see if there's supplemental essay questions. Sometimes they're obvious and then sometimes they're a little hidden in there. So I always tell uh, students to go through and answer all the questions and then you'll see if there is a short supplemental essay. Um, my recommendation is for seniors to put all of those prompts into one Google Doc so they know what they're dealing with and then look at, okay, I have a month to do this many essays and you know really start assigning some you know kind of artificial deadlines so that they can get through the next um the next month or so um with um you know with time to spend on those um i also tell seniors the supplemental essays um in my opinion are just as important if not more important than the main essay what colleges are looking for in those supplemental essays are really you know, why you're a good fit for their school. Regardless of the prompt, they're looking at, um, you know, your general interest in that school. So they can be really specific and really range, you know, in topic. 
Um, but um, sometimes they're short. So sometimes it might be 200 words, 150 words. Some students might not think they're as important as they really are. So it's just, again, important to spend time on those supplemental essays, be thoughtful, um, and um, you know, certainly revise, edit, get support from counselors, teachers, um, attend some of my workshops, and just um, you know, really be thorough on all of the essays. And then another really important part of the common application is the activity section, which um, I often find seniors tend to undersell themselves in that section. So this is an opportunity for seniors to really talk about all the great things that they've done throughout high school. And there's 10 activities that you can fit into the common application. And um, it's just a short description of what you did for that activity. Um, so you want every word to count. So you want to, it doesn't need to be a complete sentence, but you want to be really descriptive and articulate about what you've accomplished in that specific activity. So activities could be clubs, they could be, it could be work experience, it could be family responsibilities, maybe you have to um, take care of a younger sibling at home, could be tutoring, sports, obviously volunteer work. So there's a lot that can go in that section. And so this is where parents can often, I, I feel, can be really helpful is I always tell seniors to show that activity section to your parents because we as parents probably remember more about what our seniors, um, what our kids do um, than, some, than sometimes they do. And we may think of something that they may have forgotten. So this would be a great way to get involved as a parent is just asking um, your child to take a look at the activity se a section, what are you including, um, and you know, be involved in that. And then just two other um, you know, small pieces of the Common App that I did wanna mention. Um, most things in this process that are optional are not optional. However, these two, um, these two next um, bullets here are definitely optional. So there is a COVID um, optional prompt that's a short essay and asks students to reflect on the impact that COVID had on, on their life during the past year and a half. And this is truly optional. So, um, you know, some students didn't have access to Wi-Fi. Some students had to take care of younger siblings while their parents worked. Um, some students' grades suffered and they needed to explain it. So if, if there was a significant impact, that's where you can, you know, explain it in that section instead of using like your main essay for that. Um, but again, most students are leaving this blank. So don't feel like you need to write anything in there. And then lastly, there is an additional info section, again, truly optional. And, um, but this is an opportunity for, for students to possibly explain something that might need explanation. Again, maybe a grade on a transcript, maybe um, a student maybe skipped a course or couldn't fit in a course on a transcript, or it could be, you know, maybe the, the student had several activities and they couldn't fit into the activity section something needed further explanation, that could go into the additional information section. And that's right after the essay section. But again, this is, this is truly optional. So this is what seniors are, are busy doing. They're, like I said, either you know, just starting or finalizing, but you know, for the most part, this is where all of our students, uh, students are probably spending a lot of their um, uh, evening and weekend hours right now. So everybody is familiar now with, uh, with SCORE, and this is the replacement for Naviance. And um, we've been finding students have, um, you know, just been saying overall that it's uh, very, very easy to use, very easy to navigate. Um, so in the senior meeting that counselors had uh, yesterday, this was really explained in detail. And again, this is something that seniors will take care of, but as parents, you can kind of check in to make sure you know, they, they actually did a few of these things. So three basic steps uh, that need to happen on, on their SCORE account. Um, one is completing the FERPA, which is basically waiving your rights, saying that you're not going to review your recommendation letters. So we do recommend that, colleges recommend it. So it's just about clicking wave by wave my rights. And um, second, adding colleges to your applying list, which I'm going to show you what that looks like um, in a minute, and then inviting your teachers on SCORE. So we use SCORE to send your transcript, the counselor letter, and your teacher letters. So that's important to remember. That's how all of those documents get to colleges. And then the student is obviously res responsible for submitting their own common application. 
So I'm just going to go through these really quickly because, again, most seniors have seen this and can come back to it when they're ready to do it. But this is um, this is what the FERPA looks like. It's just top right corner. Just again, signing it takes you know very just not even a minute. Um, but this is again where I think could be helpful for parents to take a look at is um, so it's really important that any college that a student is applying to is in this applying list because if it's not, nothing will go from the high school. So if a senior knows where they're applying right now, I and I just keep encouraging seniors to put put it in the applying list. And when you add the school, like this this student here is applying to Duke, when they added the school, it would it will ask you are you applying early decision, early action, regular decision. So you just choose how you're applying, and then it adds it. So right now, um, as a counselor, if I was a student's counselor, I would then get an email indicating that the student has Duke on their list. I would know that my count, my recommendation will need to get ready, and teachers will be notified that their letters will need to be ready for this application. So, um, so again, we just, you know, there's a lot of, um, a lot of layers to this application. And I do feel like this is one area that as parents, we can you know, just check our, our kids' accounts and just make sure that this is accurate because it, it could be easy to forget. So we just wanna make sure that, um, that seniors know that this is very important. And then once a student is actually applied, then they can move it over to the applied column um, we're not as concerned about that right now because eventually, you know, we can even do that for them. Um, but right now we would need the applying list accurate so we know where to send the transcripts and letters of recommendations. And these are just very clear steps. As long as a student follows this to a T, it is very easy. You're basically just inviting your two teacher recommendations on score. And then step five, it is important for students to remember they need to also add their teachers and counselors to the common application in the recommender section. So again, you may not, this may not be familiar to you yet because you might not have gotten to this point yet, but when you do, when it comes time to get recommendations in order, just refer back to the slide. And as long as you're follow steps one through five, it, it's, it's very self-explanatory. Um, as I mentioned, the student that added um, Duke their, to their applying list was applying early decision. Um, and so a, a student applying early decision is, um, is going to need to sign an agreement because again, it's binding. So we need to make sure that parents, um, parents are aware, uh, the counselor is aware, and the student is aware that it is a binding contract. And so this contract will need to be signed in SCORE. And again, it's, it's once you add the school and you say you're applying early decision, it prompts you to sign it and then put your parents contact and then um, a parent will receive um, a notification to sign it. And as well as the counselor. So again, it's very self-explanatory um, once you put in your applying early decision, but just so you're aware that this, this contract will need to be signed in SCORE. And it actually also needs to be signed in the common application. Again, very self-explanatory, just, just something to, to be aware of. Um, so standardized testing is obviously a hot topic right now. I think um, I'm asked probably both of these questions um, probably at least 10 times a day. Um, so should I apply test optional? So the majority of, of schools are test optional. And test optional really means test optional. And I know it's hard to believe that, especially for the more selective schools. Um, but what are, you know, our, as a department, um, the National Association for College Counseling, you know, our peers, what we all recommend is looking at the colleges that you're applying to and looking at what is their median um, what, what is their median uh, scores from last year? And do you fall within there? Do you fall within the range from last year? And if so, you can submit your scores. Um, if you're below the average, you know, you might want to consider applying test optional. This can be something you can run by your counselor, but you really should, you know, just again, check what the average is from last year at that school. And, you know, you're pretty safe if it's well on the average, but if you're below, then you're, you might be better off just applying test optional. 
Um, there are a few schools that are not test optional, but really the majority of schools are, are test optional. Um, and then the second question that comes up a lot is how do I send my test scores? So the, mo the majority of schools do allow um, students to self-report their standardized testing, and that includes AP scores, SATs, and ACTs in the common application. So there's a testing section in the common application. And um, as long as you put your scores in there, if a school allows self-reporting, that's all you need to do. Now, sometimes when you submit your application, you'll then log on to that college portal. And sometimes they want you to self-report the scores again in the portal. So that's why, again, it's just important to really pay attention to email, directions, and detail, because this really can vary from school to school. Um, there are some schools that do want official scores. Um, I was sitting with somebody today, and they're applying to University of Pittsburgh, and um, they require official scores. So what that means is then you need to log on to the, your ACT or SAT um, account and then send them directly from College Board or, or ACT. Um, so again, you won't know this unless you're like really looking at the directions and you know just being, again, paying attention to detail. Um, you do need to pay to send your scores. So that's why we do recommend looking because you can save yourself some money if they allow self-reporting and then just putting them on the common application. And the majority of schools will allow you to submit your higher, highest scores and will allow um, from multiple test dates as well, especially right now. But again, that really varies from school to school. Um, I did mention AP scores. AP scores you do not need to send um, officially yet until you're accepted and decide that's where you're going. Um, but you can definitely self-report those on your common application. And generally, we recommend um, students applying to the, you know, the most selective schools. If you have a four or a five, those are excellent to report, maybe sometimes a three. But if you have lower than a three, you know, sometimes lower than a four, then you can just, you know, just not include it. And, and that's fine, too. Um, and these are topics that, um, you know, we'll continue to address with students in individual meetings. You know, we know it's stressful. You know, it's certainly nice for, you know, a large number of students that schools are test optional, but can also create some anxiety about, you know, is it really test optional? So, um, but I can assure you, you know, we do a lot of networking with admissions uh, counselors. We attend a lot of workshops. Um, you know, we've attended a lot already in the last two weeks of school. And, you know, schools are really saying, you know, if, if we're test optional, we're test optional. And we saw students get into great schools um, last year that did not submit testing. Um, I'm hearing, you know, on average, most um, students like around like 40% submitted testing, 40 to 50% um, at most schools. Again, that varied, but, um, but that, you know, seems to be a percentage that keeps coming up. Um, so once your applications are submitted, it's, a um, huge accomplishment, uh, feels amazing, especially when you fit that, uh, finish that first application. Um, so then what's next? So then you wanna log into your college portal and that's where you're gonna really monitor to make sure all your documents are received. And like I said, sometimes they want you to upload additional information into that portal. Could be again, self-reported scores, um, could be your first quarter grades when they come out. Um, it's also a place that sometimes allows for um, like a supplement, um, you know, maybe a music recording or an art supplement if you didn't see that on the common application. So definitely be logging into the college portals after you've submitted your application to see, you know, if there's anything else that that needs to be submitted and that everything is, is there. Um, speaking of sec, uh, first quarter grades, um, they are optional. Uh, we, we do not send them automatically they can really help a student's application. So we highly recommend seniors um, obviously do as well um, as they can and then send their first quarter grades. So they can either upload them into the college portal, they can email them directly to the admissions office, or they can ask the house guidance assistant to send the grades on their behalf. Um, but that's something you should be looking ahead um, to in November. Um, and then once, again, your first round of applications have been submitted, then it, it's, you know, time to relax a little bit there. 
I did also want to point out, um, you know, most of you have probably heard this term demonstrated interest and um, I, I called it here expressing your interest. Um, many colleges are, are, are saying now that they're not um, tracking demonstrated interest. Um, but really, what is demonstrated interest? It's as simple as that as just showing interest in a college. And while a college may not technically track demonstrated interest, they're paying attention to, to the interest that you've shown in some ways. Um, so one of the best ways to show interest is through our college rep visits, which just started this week. Um, so I did send an email about that, but if you missed it, so you know, what are the college rep visits? Um, so the admissions counselor that reads applications from Greenwich High School will come to Greenwich High School either in person during the day or um, virtual after school and provide a little information session. But it's a great opportunity for students to introduce themselves, get the contact, follow up with an email, thanking them for coming to the high school, asking a couple questions. Very often, the admissions counselor will talk about what they like to see in supplemental essays, tips on the application in general. So you really do want to make sure that you're attending these um, visits um, for any schools that do come that you're applying to. Now, not all colleges come, especially this year. Um, we do have a number that are coming in person, but, um, but several are virtual. And I will show you in one of the next slides how you'll see the calendar on SCORE, but that's, that's how you see the rep visits. Um, and then I also will be sending out, like I did last Friday, the college and career update, which is just a little newsletter that I'll send out to all seniors and parents every week. And I'll put the upcoming rep visits for that week so, so that you can see week by week, um, you know, who's coming. Another great way to show interest is interviewing. So not all colleges interview, but that's another another thing parents can be helpful with is, is looking and seeing what colleges interview and how they interview. Um, some schools will offer virtual interviews with an admissions counselor, could be with a student. Um, and, and, you know, generally they're informal, but students obviously should prepare for them and, you know, be able to articulate really why they're interested in that college and, um, and really articulate all the great things that they've done throughout high school. I always recommend students go back to their senior brag packet that they did for their counselor and really read through that in addition to their essays before they go on an interview, whether it's in person or virtual. Um, that's just kind of a great way to help prepare. And I will be running some uh, interview workshops um, a little bit later in the fall. Most alumni interviews um, are offered in November for early action or early decision schools. So not too many students are interviewing like right now, but you know, it's, there's, there's some schools that, that may be interviewing. So it's just best to check each college website. Do they interview? Do I need to set up the interview or do they contact me after I submit my application? Um, so those are kind of good things to be looking at now because if you did need to schedule them on your own, even if you could schedule it a month out, it might be something to, you know, to start to start scheduling. Um, college night is um, happening on October 14th. Unfortunately, we didn't have college night last year. So some seniors, this might be the first time that you're attending college night unless you went as a sophomore. This is a huge evening when usually we have about 200, 240 um, colleges that come set up in the student center. And usually the person that's behind the table is an admissions, the admissions counselor that's again, reading your application. So a great way to show interest. You sign a little card that you were there, introduce yourself, ask a couple questions. Um, this year, admissions counselors at many schools are not traveling, so it will be a much smaller scale. We will be putting out the list of schools that are coming to college night, um, at least a draft um, right at the beginning of October. I think right now we're at about 140, 100, close to 150 now um, schools that are attending. So we still you know, have a good number. It's not as extensive as it was in past years, um, but definitely something that seniors should take advantage of. And I also, I mentioned earlier, supplemental essays being another way to show, you know, that interest, that fit. Um, and then also there's so many virtual offerings now. So every college has a virtual information session, webinars, like all sorts of virtual opportunities that students can take advantage of. And um, some schools really, you know, are paying attention to whether students do that. 
And what I usually tell students is, you know, if I'm looking to, if I'm an admissions counselor, you know, looking to make a decision on an application and I see that a student, you know, didn't show any of this interest, I'm going to think that maybe they're not really going to come. And so, you know, I might take somebody that maybe did some of these things and really invested the time in my school. So, you know, not to say that you need to do every single thing out there, but, um, but just keep, keep in mind that those virtual offerings are very easy to access. Um, so something that, you know, you should be continuing to do. So this is where you'll see the college rep um, uh, calendar on SCORE. Now, if, uh, if the colleges are in, um, in, their, in the students following list, they're gonna get automatic emails saying that the visits have been scheduled. And, and admissions counselors are contacting us on a daily basis scheduling. So what's in here now, is not necessarily going to be all the schools that are coming. Um, but the busiest time is, is really the month of October. And then they really, they really end um, like the beginning of November. So the bulk of the visits are between like mid-September and end of October. So in, um, in the events and deadlines um, section, you can just kind of scroll through and see all of the visits that we currently have scheduled. If it is a virtual, um, if it is a virtual uh, visit, then the link is right here, launch meeting. So very simple to access. I always recommend, you know, when I'm on some of these, um, some of these visits, I see a lot of students don't have their camera on, um, they're muted, and the admissions counselor will ask a question like, "Tell me, can you go around and introduce yourself?" And sometimes students are not really paying attention. So if you're gonna log on, um, I would recommend, you know, if you're comfortable, have your camera on, but definitely like be paying attention and engage and have a couple of good questions to, um, to ask at these visits. Can I and please again, interrupt for yeah. a moment? I'm sorry, yeah. Allison. One, there's one related question to this. Um, uh, either a parent or a student has noticed that maybe when you move colleges from following to applying, you might not get alerts from SCORE. So uh, families, please know that, that we're using SCORE more extensively this year than we did last year. So we're just getting to know some of its quirks. So if, if we don't know about that yet, we can definitely find out. Yeah, that was brought to my attention um, from a parent and I did report that to support. I have not heard back on it yet. So if it is the case, like I said, just be looking at that um, college and career update that goes out every Friday. That's good, we have um, a solution. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, that would definitely be unfortunate if that was the case, but I have heard that from a couple of parents, a uh, couple of students already. Um, any other questions while I'm here on the visits? There were definitely a few questions in regard to like really how binding is early decision. Um, um, it is a contract that people are um, are entering into, um, and regard. I, I think I'm right, Allison, but that regardless of whether or not your financial aid package comes in, you know, well, they really do expect you to go there. Um, but there is some flexibility, I assume, um, if literally a family cannot afford to go once they've gotten their package. Yeah, that's really the only flexibility in coming out of an early decision agreement is financially. Like if you didn't get the package, the financial aid package that was expected. Um, and if a family is applying for financial aid, we always recommend um, that they do the net price calculator on that college website and be very comfortable with, with those numbers before they're making, again, that early decision, you know, decision. Um, but um, aside from that, it is it is a binding contract, and that's why the counselor is invested in signing it, the um, the parent and the student. Um, and then speaking of financial aid, uh, if you are applying for financial aid, hopefully you were able to attend the financial aid uh, the funding presentation last night with Judy. And if not, it was recorded, and we will be sending that out. But parents should just be aware, October 1st, um, the FAFSA becomes available, and that's the free financial aid um, application that, um, that you'll use. The CSS profile is a application for uh, many private schools. So if a college requires the CSS profile, you need to complete both. I will say the FAFSA is, can be very simple. It's, um, it's linked to the IRS now and it really isn't too time consuming. The CSS profile is a little bit of a different story. It can take a little more time. Um, 
but um, you know, the process can be tedious, just like the college application process. You know, after you submit the, the applications, sometimes there's a need for verification and sending documents. So again, it's just kind of paying attention to the, you know, the detail and 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 what's needed there. Um, I did also want to quickly mention about merit scholarships. So merit scholarships um, are typically awarded, um, not all colleges offer merit scholarships, but a lot do. And they're usually awarded um, based on just the, the application, the student's application to the college. Sometimes there might be an additional essay, but generally speaking, it's um, they're automatically considered for it. Um, but I bring it up here because uh, many colleges, um, if you're applying regular decision, um, you may be required to submit your application earlier, like December 1st, sometimes November 15th, um, to be considered for merit scholarships. So again, just be aware that it could be an earlier deadline, even though you're applying regular decision. So it's, you know, just something to, to again, look at for each school that you're applying to. Um, so that's, you know, really kind of the, the, the nuts and bolts here. Um, I think we wanted to certainly leave some time for Q and A, and um, you know, get to anything that we might have missed. And yeah, and there are some very good questions here. I'd like to answer just like a couple of you know, kind of quick ones. Um, one parent asked, like, if they're uh, if a a teacher is writing a letter, but they have left Greenwich High School, are they able to um, you know to work out that process? So yes, if any of you out there have um, a teacher who retired or left Greenwich High School last year, they usually work directly with um, our guidance assistants. Um, so um, either, either they will be working directly with them or maybe we're going to open up an accountant score for them and they're gonna process it directly. So we usually offer them a couple of options, uh, but the fact that your recommender has left Greenwich High School um, is not a problem at all. Um, the other thing is a couple of people ask, well, what about maybe, you know, non-academic or informal recommendations? Typically those are um, uh, sent to the school counselor. Um, if an additional letter of recommendation, um, like we, we really will only send two letters of recommendation through SCORE, um, the student can always contact the college and find out if they would be willing to read another non-academic letter um, and, and you know, deliver them directly to the college in whichever way that the, the um, college will accept it. Yeah, and typically that's through emailing the admissions office. The, the outside recommender would email the admissions office directly with the letter. Mm -hmm. um, they can upload it into the Common App as well, but that, that can be a little tedious. So generally we recommend sending it in an email if there is an outside letter. And those that includes alumni letters as well. Yeah, and there are a couple of questions about deadlines. Um, when Allison sent you that first um, email with the link to our, you know, welcome back senior meeting agenda, that senior meeting agenda has the deadlines for requesting the transcript uh, very easily in there. So please um, take a look at that document um, because again, we do uh, October 1st is really the best time for students to let us know that they're gonna be applying to someplace within that October to November one timeline um, so that we can get, because um, it takes some time for teachers and counselors to write letters of recommendation. Mm -hmm. Another question here, which I do get a lot too, is a lot of students um, think they need to wait to submit their application until their teachers and counselor oh, yeah. and um, transcript have, have been sent. That is definitely not the case. So if a student is ready to submit an application, they should be clicking submit. And then the, the transcript and letters can follow. So there's no reason to hold up an application. Um, you know, it's best to just submit it once, once they feel good about it. Um, and then a question about um, last year's admitted students. Um, so in addition to SCORE, having all the data um, for the last, uh, I think, four or five years, um, we also have the annual college book and students can take out the college book from the GHS Media Center overnight. And then there's a question about college portals. Um, are those accessed through SCORE or individual schools? So that would be the individual schools. So if I applied to Southern Connecticut State University, 
I would then log into my Southern College portal directly on their website. And you'll get an email when you submit your application from Southern with information on how to access your portal. And very good questions about College Night. So here's where we are with College Night and whether parents can attend. Um, we believe we are going to have to limit the number of people in the student center. Uh, we have about 140 colleges coming, which is less than the 220 something that we usually have. Um, so that's going to limit the number of people who probably attend anyway. Um, but right now we are working very closely with um, Dr. Jones and Mary Keller, our uh, school nurse supervisor to find out what they really want us to do. Our priority, um, you know, for me, I'm going to speak for myself, my priority would be to have our juniors and seniors be able to attend. And I'd really like to be able to open it up to the community of juniors and seniors as we usually do. Um, I, you know, I hope you all know that College Night is not only for um, Greenwich High School students, it's for students in the region. Um, so I would prefer to maybe have it open to juniors and seniors in our area. Uh, we might be able to do something else for parents on that evening, like maybe have a, you know, a separate um, activity for them. Um, but um, we may instead have, um, you know, a smaller number of students at one time, and they may be able to bring a parent. So please bear with us as we're trying to figure out our COVID restrictions and uh, kind of go from there. Also a few questions about the activities section on the common application. Uh, they should be in order of importance to you. So it does say that in the directions. And if a student already put the activities in there, it's very easy to move them around. But yes, they should be in order of importance. And then no documentation is required from the activity to kind of show proof of it or documentation of the hours. Um, you know, that's it's a you know, just the student self-reporting it. Um this is a very interesting question. Um, what type of, uh, oh, I'm sorry. There, well, actually, there are a couple of questions about what type of questions should students ask the college reps or you know, what kind of questions you should ask on the visits. If you guys could please look at our GHS planning guide. We actually have a whole section on getting ready for college night and we will be working with the juniors um, to make sure that they are ready for college night um, through our uh, little homeroom activity on the 29th with the counselors. And um, there's also definitely questions that you can ask when you are going um, to visit. Um, we've carefully compiled them and we, you know, we think it would be very valuable if you could take a look at the GHS planning guide. One of the questions that I personally like to, um, to have students ask, especially at the rep visits at the high school is about supplemental essays. So if you know, first of all, you should find out if the college requires a supplemental essay. But that's a great, you know, that's the person that's going to be reading your application. So I always tell students to ask for, you know, general tips on, on that supplemental essay, what they like to see, what kind of suggestions do you have for me. Um, but there are a list of, of great questions in the planning guide. Mm -hmm. You know, anything about asking about your specific major, student life on campus, um, general tips on the application process. Uh, and yes, I, I do want to confirm that neither the FAFSA nor the CSS pro profile do not come out until October 1st. Um, so you have some time, you know, to get the applications for college done now and then maybe shift to, um, you know, the financial aid forms on October 1st. Um, one student is asking about applying to schools in other countries. Actually, SCORE should have a good number of universities in mm -hmm. other countries, right? Because I'm assuming it's like Navion's to Allison, right? Um, yeah, and if, you know, if not, yeah. then we send um, yeah. some of the documents, you know, via email or if they require a FedEx package, you know, we work with that. Um, do divorced parents need to both fill out the FAFSA? Uh, no, it is for the FAFSA, it's only the custodial parents, so where the child lives. If, however, you fill out the CSS profile that often asks for the non-custodial parent information. And you can find out which colleges require the CSS profile uh, by taking a look at the link um, uh, to that website. Um, if you type it in, it will come up, but I think we maybe linked it to that um, little uh, agenda that we pushed out for you. I think, you know, for the other questions on financial aid, I would definitely recommend watching that recording from last night. We actually did cannot record those from Barnum. Oh, oh. Yeah, so oh, no, we don't record that. them, but um, 
the um, GHS planning guide has a big section on funding your college education that kind of goes over most things. Um, and then when October 1st comes, I will be sending out information just to seniors and parents of seniors with a nice synopsis of uh, financial aid process. And then we have a meeting in January as well, where I talk a little bit about like, what do you do now that you've applied <laughs> for financial aid and how do you read them? And uh, we'll either do that virtually or in person this year. So the copy of the planning guide that we're referring to is on the guidance section of the web, of the Greenwich High School website. Um, if you're applying for SAT optional schools, do you grant permission on the FERPA form? FERPA is um, really protecting the letter of recommendation writers. FERPA really only has to do with letters of recommendation. It doesn't have to do with other uh, student records. A question about like how many colleges to apply to and how many reach schools. To be honest, it really depends on the, the list um, and the student, but generally we recommend around 12 schools, two to three likelies, a couple reaches, the rest in that target range. But again, it, it can really vary based on the competitiveness and, and type of a list, but that's a general rule of thumb. And is there an advantage to submitting your application before the deadline? Um, definitely if it's a rolling decision school, um, but I think there's definitely some advantage from a processing standpoint for, a, for like large public schools. They're, you know, just going through a, a lot of documents and, you know, if you're submitting your application like right before the deadline and then something's missing. So I, I generally recommend trying to submit your applications a couple weeks before the deadline for especially those like bigger state schools. It's not necessarily gonna give you an edge, but you know, from a processing standpoint it can be helpful. Um, it looks like we have a student asking about the transcripts if you're applying on the college's website. There are a few colleges that require you to you know, apply it in a different way than the common application, but you will still be asking for your transcript on SCORE. And then again, your guidance assistant is your friend. <laughs> Stop in to see them, email them, call them. Yes. They, they will help you out with that. Very good friend. Yeah. Um, one parent is really asking about the agenda, the welcome back senior meeting agenda. I look for an email from Allison Lockridge. Um, she sent that to you probably last week. Yes, and I will, well, we'll send this recording out to all seniors. Um, we are recording this, right? <laughs> yes. Um, so we'll send this recording out um, and I'll, I'll attach the, um, the senior meeting agenda with the slides again, just so you have it in your, fresh in your inbox. Yes, and the original email from me, um, I, I, I well, my welcome one to all people, all uh, grade levels, I sent out the GHS planning guide, but I can um, certainly send it to everybody again. And it's on the website too. Um, could, an, could an AP uh, art teacher write a letter of recommendation? Certainly. And especially if that, you know, if the student is applying to an art school, it would be mm -hmm. perfectly appropriate and a good idea to have an art teacher write a uh, letter of recommendation. You know, very few schools require certain things, but, um, you know, we really need to respect our teachers um, time. Um, they are not obligated to write letters of recommendation. It is a huge, um, you know, uh, gift that they do for the seniors. So we really want um, students to be able to ask two teachers. And I don't know that there's like ever a time where um, that is not enough. Um, you know, maybe it's a rare exception, but if you're really concerned, um, just speak to your, your house counselor. Are the guidance assistant listed on the website for each house? Yes, and I have emailed their names to you and phone numbers <laughs> as well. <laughs> And I'll get them to maybe set, reach out to all their senior parents. Uh, we're meeting actually tomorrow. Uh, Allison and I are meeting with the five guidance assistants tomorrow so we can ask them to make sure that they sh um, send their email all, to all seniors and senior parents so they know what kind of things they can help with. 
there is um, a couple questions on um, on essay reviews. Um, so students can certainly ask a teacher, their counselor, um, me to review a college essay. I will say that um, you know people are very inundated with requests uh, right now. So the sooner, if you feel like you do need an essay reviewed, um, you should really should be reaching out and making an appointment, you know, sometime very soon if you have an early deadline. And it doesn't necessarily need to be just an English teacher either. A lot of people feel like I have to ask an English teacher. I mean, you know, a lot of different teachers are, um, are, are great with the college essays. So, um, but again, you just need to be conscious of their time and, um, you know, appreciative of their time because it, it would be, you know, an after school or, or morning commitment. I think we've got to most of the questions and, and your senior, seniors are going to be meeting with their counselors, um, as Judy mentioned, over the course of the next couple of weeks individually. So a lot of these questions um, can also be asked during, during that meeting. Um, but certainly feel free to reach out to, again, the guidance assistant about any of the, you know, kind of um, application procedures and then bigger picture things like lists and essays and things like that to, um, to the counselor. But just know that, you know, we recognize it is a very, very busy time of the year and, um, and very stressful time of the year for seniors. And, you know, we're really all here to help them. So, you know, no question is silly. It's always best to ask a question. And um, you know, somebody will you know somebody will hopefully hopefully help help you. Yeah, and there's just another question about um, transferring. Um, if you've transferred into Greenwich High School, typically colleges will take um, the transcripts that we send. So we transfer your um, credits onto our transcript. And in addition, we send the transcript that we have um, to the college. Uh, the only time that you have to send a transcript directly from a prior school is uh, to the NCAA. They require that you send it to them directly. But otherwise, we have your transcript and we will send that with it. Okay, Judy, I think, uh, I think we've I think got all the questions. Okay. All right. Thank you, everyone. We really appreciate your time. And, um, you know, we look forward to working with you um, to help you uh, through this process. So take good care of yourselves. All right. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night. And thank you.